this afternoon. Um, what I'm going to be doing today is talking a little bit about Peter Martyr Vermigli. Uh, he is an Italian uh, born Reformed theologian. And uh, he did a lot of his early work in Catholic Italy. And um, then he made his decision to flee for Protestant Northern Europe. And he influenced many Italians to convert and flee as well. I can't say that I'm the most knowledgeable about Vermigli, but I was fascinated by him. And particularly um, by... Uh, Um, the set that I got of these books, this has not even been opened yet. It's Peter Martyr Vermigli, um, Amito Campi, and Joseph C. McLeland, and it's uh, 16th Century Essays and Studies from the Peter Martyr Library, Volume 1. So I'm going to go ahead and open this up and take a bit of a look at it. I have um, other works by Vermigli. And really what this is going to be today is kind of just a video to continue to make content and um, to um, allow for you guys to join me as I pursue more of my studies. And what I'm looking at and trying to study right now is more um, of the English Reformation and Counter-Reformation and the interplay between um, within that framework. Um, so that's very interesting to me, but I'm kind of taking a little bit of a break and wanting to look at some of Vermigli's works, so I just cracked that open. Now, the works that I'm familiar with are um, by a Jesuit scholar, um, the ones that I've been looking at, John Patrick Donnelly S.J., who is the general editor of this work. Um, so, and anyways, I was just outdoors, so let me go ahead and take off my hat here. Um, Peter Martyr Library, Volume 9, Commentary on Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, Peter Martyr Vermigli. General Editor's Preface, Editor's Preface, Introduction by Joseph C. McLeland, Text and Translation, Commentary on Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, Dedication by Guilio Santern, Santern Zeno, Introduction by Peter Martyr Vermigli, Book 1, Happiness, Chapter 1, Chapter 2, all the way through Chapter 13, Book 2, Virtue, Chapter 1 through Chapter 9, Book 3, Will, Chapter 1 and Chapter 2, Appendix of Works by Peter Martyr, Bibliography, Index and Scripture References, Index of Classical and Medieval References, Subject Indexes about the Editors. And now, I don't have a camera for my page here. Um, I, I'm going to go back to that where I was doing um, a camera where you could see me and you can see my desktop screen. Um, but a lot of these videos I'm making right now are also for my own reference, kind of like a vlog, and it's for educational purposes as I am going to be eventually pursuing an additional academic degree, I, I think, um, possibly. I don't really have a real practical need for one. However, um, I'm just wanting to be structured and kind of driven in my goals um, as far as academia is concerned. So, <clears throat> moving right along. Um, also, since a lot of my training is medical-based, if I wanted to teach more theological or philosophical or literary based, even though that was much of my undergraduate formation. Um, as many of you know, my career was um, in an entirely different field within medicine. So um, an additional degree would be well, not that I'm going to be really teaching the material other than I'm, I'm plenty satisfied with my books and reading and writing and um, my life now. But um, you never really do know. And I think the structure and discipline of that is, so it's, it's a possibility. Um, adding an additional uh, doctorate to my curriculum vitae that's more um, humanities oriented. Anyways, um, so this is what I'm looking at right now is the Devenant Institute um, and it's D-A-V-E-N-A-N-T-I-N 
S T I T U T E dot org for Migley, Forgotten Reformer. Peter Martyr for Migley, the Forgotten Reformer. <clears throat> so I was first introduced to him by an Orthodox Presbyterian um, minister when I did join for a very short time Orthodox Presbyterian. Um, church. Uh, many of you know part of my journey was moving through more Calvinistic and Reformed um, theology and then going into a more liturgical direction. Not that there is not liturgical um, um, liturgy within certain Reformed traditions or anything like that, but it goes on with an article by Chris Costaldo, and um, I'm not going to read his article, but you can find it uh, it looks pretty informative, and this is a good website that I wouldn't really shy away from steering people towards. I've purchased this book, uh, <clears throat> Peter Martyr Vermigli on Original Sin, Volume 1 of a New Translation of the Loci Communes. Is, I, is that uh, commonplace, as I'm, I'm assuming? Uh, translated and edited by Kirk Summers. I'm not entirely sure, but that's what I assume. Um, so... Yeah, this is uh, a pretty good point of um, starting some of your journeys um, in Vermiglian studies. Now, um, a little bit of background information about him too. Uh, his early work as a reformer was in Catholic Italy. He just fled to Northern uh, Europe. He influenced the Edwardian Reformation, including the Eucharistic service of the 1552 Book of Common Prayer. And um, I think that's fascinating. I'm fascinated um, and really wanting to read some of his material on um, the Eucharist. That will be um, interesting. But I want to further look at this volume here. Um, So basically commentary on Aristotle, which I think is awesome. I haven't read Aristotle really for um, quite a bit of time. Oh, so here is um, a bibliography. And then what is this? Uh, this light is just... I might not have the best lighting in the video, but I got to kill the um, background light here. Uh, additions of classical to early modern works, Aquinas, Thomas, commentary on the Nicomachean Ethics, translated by C.I. Litzinger, Chicago, Henry Regency, 1964. In Decum Libros Ethicorum Exposito, Volume 1 of the Commentary of the Nicomachean Ethics, translated by C.I. Litzinger, Chicago, Henry uh, Regency. 1964, Summa Theologica, Alba ed Pauline, Arist Aristotle Nicomachean Ethics, in the Basic Works of Aristotle, edited by Richard McEwen, translated by W.D. Ross, York, Random House, 1966. Um, that's just some. Armstrong, A.H., editor, Cambridge, History of Later Greek and Modern Medieval Philosophy, Cambridge, Cambridge, University Press, 1988. Quite an extensive bibliography. And I also have a book that is just all um, uh, bibliography of all these different works of uh, um, Vermigli. And then back here, subject index. So let's look at, let me see here. Let me see. Eucharist, contingency ascribed to page 147. <clears throat> Let's see. I'll just start reading over here on page 146. Even more astonishing are Themistius' Themistus remarks concerning numbers. He says, what Aristotle also mentions further down, that Plato did not ascribe ideas to numbers, evidently because they are so arranged that they form a self-contained set, whereas ideas should refer to those beings that are not interconnected. 
If it had been so, how then would the Platonists, who attached so much importance to their arithmetic, defend the validity of the science of mathematics? For unless in their theory there was also room for ideas of numbers, nothing could be known about numbers. Therefore, in my opinion, if they wish to be logical and coherent with what they had established as the foundations of their theory, they must have admitted the existence of ideas of all things that may be produced or perceived. Some critics are also in doubt as to what characteristics the Platonists would ascribe to ideas. The answer is that they are indivisible, for they cannot be divided as if they would absorb one element from one source and another element from a different one. As far as their location is concerned, they cannot be said to be completely separate <clears throat> from their material representations. If they are shared by the latter, they are inherent in them just as similarity is inherent in similar objects. I Ideas are not limited in space since they are incorporeal. Some commentators compare ideas with light that is inherent and illuminated objects, even if it is not spatially comp com comprised within them. And this is very rarefied quality or spiritual, as they say. The answer is identical as in the case of the human spirit, namely that each idea is complete within the whole as well as with each of its particular representations. These are the conclusions that may be drawn from Plato as well as from the Platonists. Now we should discuss Aristotle's objections to the, this point. As Aristotle declares, accidents are produced and there is a science that deals with them. Therefore, each accident will have its own particular idea and so an accident will be separated from its subject. This, however, is contrary to the notion of true accidents whose very nature and essence is that they be connected with their subjects. If Aristotle had raised a similar objection now against the transubstantiators, they would have ridiculed him since it was very easy for them to attribute contingency to the Eucharist <coughs> when the substance is removed. Aristotle criticizes the Platonists on this ground also that accordingly to their theory there should also exist an idea of ideas 148 if as they themselves declare specific beings should be in agreement with their ideas from those items which are similar and interconnected uh species is common form may be deduced Therefore, a common form of both an idea and its specific representations may be abstracted. The result will be that, as we have noted, there should also be an idea of ideas. Besides, those philosophers will not prove their anticipated thesis with respect to a generation of ideas. For they maintain that ideas are required in order for things to be generated from Similar beings, still the idea of those things is incorporeal, eternal, and perpetual. Whereas beings that are procreated are connected with matter and thus are mortal and fragile. Therefore, ideas differ between themselves more than in type now. Items that are distinct cannot be similar. So very interesting and uh this is a guy that i am interested in also as well who is i think the general editor of this and uh his name is john patrick i think i looked him up online before and he's got the sj at the end of his name so Society of Jesus, Jesuit. Um, so here's Marquette University, uh, John Patrick Donnelly S.J. Not a lot of information about him, though. Professor Emeritus, History, Education, Specialization, Renaissance, Reformation, and Jesuits. So that definitely seems like someone who... Um, Kind of some of his stuff seems right up my alley. <clears throat> the 
The Early Life of Jean-Patrick Donnelly, S.J., a memoir of a Jesuit professor born in 1934, relating family history, his education, and his decision to become a Jesuit. The Early Life of Patrick, S.J., March 20, 2000. John Patrick Donnelly, S.J. So this is something that I found on Marquette, uh, M-A-R-Q-U-E-T-T-E dot E-D-U. And uh, it's telling us a little bit of the life of this guy. I'm going to go ahead and read it because I am interested to know as that falls within my scope of interest and might be a scholar for me to look further into. I do have some more of these Vermigli volumes as well. Um, <clears throat> so let's just read about John Patrick Donnelly S.J. I was born and raised in Milwaukee. On my father's side, I was of, was of lace Curtain Irish descent. On my mother's side, I was of mainly of shanty Irish descent, but also was sixteenth, a sixteenth each of French and Alsatian blood. My paternal grandfather Patrick Donnelly was born in country Tyrone, Northern Ireland, September seventeenth, eighteen thirty-six, and died in Milwaukee in nineteen sixteen. He came to New York when he was 16. Two years later, he set out for the West. He made his livelihood by teaching in primary schools in Cedarburg and Racine County in 1855 through 64, then in Milwaukee, where he taught at the St. Gall's Parish School. In 1869, he taught at Pomeroy School, corner of Jackson Chicago Street, then transferred in 1873 to the third ward third district grade school where he served as a teacher and principal for 41 years a record at the time he retired june 24 1910 his retirement ceremony attracted prominent milwaukeeans who had been his students and was featured on the front page of milwaukee sentinel he published a short history of the milwaukee public schools in 1894. my paternal grandmother was born rose mclingan her father, John, ran a hotel which opened about 1850 and was destroyed in the famous Third Ward Fire. I think my paternal grandparents left a considerable fortune to their four children, my father, John, Patrick, and my aunts, Mary Elizabeth and Rose. More prominent was his brother, Joseph G. Donnelly, 1856-1916, who came from Ireland 10 years after Patrick, along with his sister and their parents, and joined Patrick, who had established uh, Beachhead, in Milwaukee, not an unusual Irish patron. After completing his education in Milwaukee Public School, Joseph taught several years in grade schools, then served as a register of probates for 16 years. He was admitted to the bar in 1879. Later, he was consul general at the American Embassy of Mexico. He ran unsuccessfully as a Democrat for Congress in 1898. He was district court judge in 1901 and chief justice of the civil courts here in 1910 until his death. And then he goes on about his father and his mother and their marriage and his mother attending the same university that he's writing this on their page uh, before marrying. Um, I'm just skipping around here. So I'm more interested in getting into his looks like he went to Jesuit boarding school which curriculum to follow. My grades were good enough for me to get to the A class, but that would have meant taking two years of Greek. My worst class was always Latin. I decided to take the curriculum for had four years of math, but no Greek and stayed in the B class. I was probably the best student in my B class, my junior and senior years, strong with English and sciences, good in math, although still weak in Latin. My senior year went to Chicago to Catholic high schools plus Campion, which had many students from the Chicago area. I ranked second and won a four-year full scholarship. Fortunately, there were no questions about Latin on the test. I planned to major in chemistry. At Campion, I played intramural football. I was also a member of the school's Marian Sodality, but did not engage in many extracurriculars. <clears throat> 
my years of camping gave me growing confidence in my academic ability. And I didn't mean just to brush aside any of the stuff about uh, his family history or anything like that. I'm just trying to get into the more academic bit uh, here, where which would be my interest. So I admired the Jesuit teachers there, and what encouraged me to consider becoming a Jesuit after graduation. My academic success at Campion probably had several sources. There were several compulsory study hall periods daily, and I probably needed the discipline. The Jesuit teachers were generally good and caring. My early success sharpened my desire to learn. My brother Mike had earlier said he planned to become a Jesuit. Instead, he went to Marquette University and he did little study despite being very bright. He then transferred to Spring Hill College, started studying and got into Marquette's law school, but his later career was a lawyer here in Milwaukee, was undistinguished. He married an Italian Chicago girl and they had a gifted son. During my junior year at Campion, my mother got a job offer from insurance. Okay. I stayed in my grandmother's apartment in Milwaukee so I could caddy and make some money. The summer after my senior year, I stayed with my mother in Simmons Point. I decided to join the Jesuits. I had it mulling over during the last semester at Campion, and I knew that seven of my classmates also decided to join the Jesuits. Doubtless, that helped my decision. Also, I was lonely at Simmons Point since I had no circle of high school chums there. But I trust spiritual considerations were primarily in my decision. I do not think my mother was happy with the idea, but she put no obstacle in my way. I went back to Campion in midsummer and took the necessary interviews for becoming a Jesuit. I left Stevens Point early in August. Back, I have never looked back or reconsidered that crucial decision. While I was at Campion, my aunt Elizabeth Donnelly and my father died in the spring of 1949. I never got to know my father very well. The inheritance of the Donnelly family fell to me and my brother and sister. Although the legal settlement came only after my entry into Jesuits, so I never shared it, but it covered the college education of my siblings and set them up fairly well after. I meant that I had no real worries about my mother's financial needs, and I took my last vows as a Jesuit in 1976. Most of my share went to my mother, some to the Jesuits. I don't know why there's in all of this information about personal financial stuff. Um, I was 17, I was, I was 17 when I entered the Jesuits and spent my two year novitate partly at Florissant, but mostly in Oshkosh. I returned to Florissant, Florissant for two years of training, mainly in languages and literature. During these years, I worked hard at Latin and became my best, it became my best tool as a scholar. I have published eight volumes of translations from Latin. I then did three years at St. Louis University studying mainly philosophy, but considerable history. Then spent three years teaching English and history at Jesuit high schools, four years studying theologies, a year advanced spiritual pastoral training, and four years doing a PhD in history. I have been a history professor at Marquette University since 1971. I'm going to look to see uh, books. What are some of the books? <clears throat> Ignatius Loyola. Jesuit writings. Oh, this looks good, and I'm sure it's expensive. 40 bucks isn't that bad, but it's not that great either. But 40 bucks for a Brill publication. Brill. John Patrick Donnelly, S.J., a biographical note in From Rome to Zurich between Ignatius and Vermigli. Author Michael W. Marr, or S.J. Ooh, I don't know if this, so here I'm seeing the, bio, the um, bibliography, Marquette University, the office of a bishop, Philip Lynchton, 1 Corinthians, why am I seeing, okay, let me, first here, here's a Robert Ballermine book, and did he have anything to do with that? That would be fascinating to learn. Ha, huh. translator, <coughs> very cool. Robert Ballermine's spiritual writings, John Patrick Donnelly, translator. 
Roland J. Teske. I'm going to take a screenshot of that and save that for later research purposes. Robert Ballermine, spiritual writings, very awesome. I need that. Especially when you want to look at things going on um, within Roman Catholicism, Sethicantism, and other ideas and questioning of a pope and that sort of thing. I can't say I'm that familiar with his writings, but it's a good starting place for me anyway. It's something to take note of. Uh, what is this? So here's the Peter Martyr Reader. I believe I have that. Books by him. Um, Goodreads author. Dialogue on the Two Natures in Christ, the Peter Martyr Library, Second One, Volume Two. Ignatius of Loyola, founder of the Jesuits. The Peter Martyr Reader. Sacred Prayers Drawn from the Psalms of David. I don't think I have that. Days of Devotion, Daily Meditations from the Good Shepherd by Pope John 23. Early Writings, Creed, Scripture, and Church. Prison Meditations on Psalms 51 and 31, Reformation Text with Translation, Biblical Studies, Volume 1, Translation and Latin Edition by Savana uh, Rola. Life, Letters, and Sermons of Peter Martyr Vermigli. Reform and Renewal, Faith of Our Fathers, Volume 2. Aha, Calvinism and Scholasticism and Vermigli's Doctrine of Man and Grace. Very much point of interest there. Life, Letters, and Sermons, Peter Martyr Library Book. Year by Year with the Early Jesuits, 1537 through 15, or 1556. Selections from the Chronicon of Juan de... Polanco, not familiar whatsoever. Letters and Sermons and Papers, Co-Fraternities and Catholic Reform in Italy, France, and Spain. Calvinism, Scholasticism, Vermigli's Doctrine of Man and Grace. So another book at this time that I was also interested in. Let me see if I can find this. It's went up in price, it seems like, quite a bit, especially the edition that I want to get eBay in stock. Protestant Scholasticism, Essays and Reassessment Paperback, Truman Carl. Got a screenshot that really quick for my reference uh, for later. Definitely something that I have been interested in. There's like a edition with a different cover here. $28.73 without the original. This is probably a, a different printing, I'm assuming. Protestant Scholasticism, Essays and Reassessment Studies in Christian History and Thought. Paperback, September 30, 2007. Traditionally, Protestant theology between Luther's early reforming career and the dawn of the Enlightenment has been seen in terms of decline and fall into the wastelands of rationalism and scholastic speculation. In this volume, a number of scholars question such an interpretation. The editors argue that the development of post-Reformation Protestantism can only be understood when a proper historical model of doctrinal change is adopted. This historical concern underlies the subsequent studies of theologians such as Calvin, Biza, Olevian, Baxter, and the two Tarantini. The results is a significantly different reading of the development of Protestant orthodoxy, uh, one which both challenges the older scholarly interpretations and cliches about the relationship of Protestantism, among other things, to scholasticism and rationalism and which demonstrates the fruitfulness of new historical approach. Contributors D.V.N. Bogchi, David C. Steinmetz, Richard A. Mueller, Frank A. James III, John L. Farthing, Lyle D. Now, this is just from uh, um, Amazon here. And I think I've looked up 
Truman before. It's available for $28.73 American. Carl R. Truman is professor of church history and historical theology, Westminster Theological Seminary, Philadelphia. So that corresponds to my definite interest in Vermigli. I'm not entirely sure what direction the rest of this video will go or my studies will go at this time. Uh, introduction by Peter Martyr Vermigli. So here's his introduction to his commentary on this work of Aristotle. Now I can easily proceed to the exposition of Aristotle, except that a certain hindrance must first be removed. It consists of what Paul said in Colossians 2. Beware lest anyone pry on you through philosophy. Truly, with such words he seems to frighten Christians away from the study of philosophy. But I am sure that if you grasp the meaning of the Apostle's statement properly, you will not be disturbed. Since true philosophy derives from the knowledge of created things and from these propositions reaches many conclusions about the justice and righteousness that God implanted naturally in human minds. It cannot therefore rightly be criticized. It is the work of God and could not be enjoyed by us without rightly be rightly without his special contribution. But Paul censored that philosophy that is corrupted by human invention and by the bitter disputes of philosophers. If they had remained within limits and had discussed only what creaturely knowledge had revealed about God and nature and the most certain reasoning, they would not have strayed from the truth. Hence the apostle says, by this philosophy, this is by ep exegesis, empty deceit. Then he adds, which has its origin in human tradition and is inspired by cosmic forces that the universe is eternal was taught by human be uh, taught by human beings not by lower creatures nature did not show that the universe is composed of the random conjunction of atoms but was conceived by empty speculation stoic fate and impassib impassibility the perpetual doubt of the academics, the motionless and idle deities of the Epicureans? Who would question that such ideas are, are empty deceit? They dreamed of community of property, of wives traded openly, of pleasure as the highest good, and God's worship in the manner of the vulgar. Yet they did not learn such things by any natural illumination or practical principles known in themselves by sure reasoning. Surely these things are poisons, and so here's the quote, uh, footnote Colossians 2 8, and then footnote on 32 per ep exegesis. Vermigli mixes Latin and Greek to render this phrase from Colossians 2 8. Continuing, uh, surely these things are poisons and corruptions of the devil. Through evil men, perverts, that gift of God, philosophy, this polluted and spoiled philosophy is what Paul wishes to avoid. Now we must see how that we have so far discussed agrees with Holy Scripture. There also we have active and contemplative knowledge. There also we have active and contemplative knowledge. The things in which we believe and that are contained in the articles of faith pertain to the contemplation, theoreticon, since we perceive them but do not create them, and although they are not included within knowledge, they are nonetheless understood. What is contained in laws, deliberations, and exhortations should be referred to as practical knowledge, practicon. For, so far, these matters agree, yet they also differ, for in philosophy, the, act, the active precedes the contemplative, because as it is said, we can contemplate neither God nor nature, by human powers, unless our emotions are first at rest. But in scripture, speculation occurs first in so much as we must first believe and be justified through faith. Afterwards, good works follow, which occur more abundantly and more frequently. We are renewed by the Holy Spirit. That is what Paul shows in his letters. For first, he deals with doctrines, only afterwards coming to moral instruction and principles for living. So also the children of Israel were first gathered in Egypt. 
under the faith of one God, the Deliverer. Afterwards, in the desert, they received laws that refer to practical knowledge. And in the Decalogue, the same order was kept. First, it is said, I am the Lord your God, which belongs to faith or theoretical knowledge. Afterwards, there follows precepts that look to the works commanded by God. The cause of this difference is the human contemplation is gained by the study of diligent reflection. Therefore, moderation of emotion is required. <clears throat> but we believe, but what we believe is received by the inspiration of God, therefore, there is no need of those preparations. According to human reason, men should first do righteous deeds before there is justification. But the order of divine sanctification is established far otherwise. First we believe and afterwards we are justified. Afterwards are justified. And then the power of our minds are restored by the Holy Spirit and by grace, and finally just and honest deeds follow. The goal of philosophy is that we reach that beatitude or happiness that can be acquired in this life by human powers, while the goal of Christian devotion is that the image in which we are created in righteousness and holiness of truth be renewed in us, so that we grow daily in the knowledge of God until we are led to see him as he is, with face uncovered, from nine, these ethica nicomachia, we will not learn about the remission of sins, about fear and faith towards God, nor justification through faith, nor yet about Christ and similar things. Such matters are brought to light by God's will. They cannot be produced by the natural knowledge from anything created. We do not deny that it often happens that the same things are commended in these ethica nicomachia. Nicomachia and are commanded by God in Holy Scripture. In such case, the topic is the same, but not its form, properties, or principles. Okay, footnote. Contemplation reduces bodily necessity to a minimum, necessities to a minimum, as close as possible to the impassive, de impassive deity whose likeness is sought. For in these, the rationale is different, as are the properties and principles, just as water from rain and from spring is the same in substance, while its powers, properties, and principles are far different. For one comes from the heat of heaven and the clouds and the cold in the middle regions of the air, while the other is drawn through the subterranean channels of the earth and from sea and is so filtered that it comes out sweet, or else by converting air to water from the cold of the place where the spring arises thus what christians do is done by the impulse of the holy spirit of god for those who act according to the holy spirit are sons of god what philosophers do about ethics is done under the guidance of the human reason they are urged to action according to what they judge to be honest and correct but for christians it has become god judges so the former think that they improve the perfect, perfect, perfect themselves if they act in this way. The latter think that they act, it is, they think that if they act, it is because one should be obedient to the divine. The former believe in themselves, the latter in God, and the words of the law that he himself gave. The former labor from self-love, while the latter are driven by the love of the one God. From these many differences, it happens that sub, substanti substanti substantially, substantially the very same thing may be pleasing to God or damned by his judgment. Let this suffice uh, concerning these differences and agreements between divine scripture on the one hand and human philosophy on the other. Let us return to the point from which we digress, namely whether this discipline is repugnant to piety. I say that this is no more against it than astrology or the nautical or military arts, or else fishing and hunting, and also knowledge of human law that everyone understands as necessary for public administration, jurisprudence, forms of its own laws and, into, and institutions out of propositions concerning the justice and goodness innate in our minds. Moral philosophers analyze the same propositions and probe them most closely so that not only might they themselves know them thoroughly, 
but also transmit them to others with great clarity. Thus, amongst the Greeks, wisdom is called Sophia, as it is meant clarity and wise. Thus, amongst the Greeks, wisdom is called Sophia, as it is meant clarity and wise. Is Sophos, and it is meant clear, Sophos. No doubt, because it clarifies the subject matter and makes it obvious, therefore those learned of the law must easily regard their own science as part of philosophy, even if it's concerning virtue, honesty, and justice. They pass less severe judgments through their legislation, 10, than philosophers do in their disputes. For example, philosophy detests ingratitude in any human condition, but the laws do not punish it unless committed by children against parents or by freedmen against their patrons. Human laws compel no one to give his goods to the needy, but philosophy commands liberty and generosity towards all. What more should be said? In praise of this kind of philosophy, Cicero exclaimed in Tusculanus 5, O philosophy, thou god of life, O thou explorer of, vir of, of vir explorer of virtue and expeller of vice, without thee what could have become not only of me but of the life of man altogether? Thou hast given birth to cities, thou hast called scattered human beings into the bond of social life, thou hast united them first of all in joint habitation, then in wedlock, then in the ties of common literature and speech, thou hast discovered laws, thou hast been the teacher of morality and order, and so forth. Everyone acknowledges how splendid it is to know the power of herbs, rocks, metals, and medicines, and we do not deny this in the least. But does it not follow from all of this that it is a worthwhile faculty by which humans acts, choices, uh, arts, methods, skills, virtues, and vices are to be perceived. What could be more noble than to know oneself? And this we know is the first place through philosophy. We should also keep in mind that Plato said that it may, may easily happen that ardent love for virtue is aroused in us if now and then its, it, it's like, likeness meets our eyes. On the other hand, the chief cause of our vices is that we could never see virtue with our own eyes. The pleasure derived from this science is not small. To know within what bounds of the illumination the nature sheds should confine itself, and how far it may extend itself in its own right. Moreover, the Christian religion is inflamed by knowledge of pagan ethics. For we understand through comparison how far these things taught in scripture surpass philosophy. For it is common saying that when opposites are compared with one another, they become clearer. Errors cannot be easily avoided unless they are first understood. Therefore, whoever knows both faculties will more easily avoid the mistake of the one, namely of human philosophy, especially when properly demonstrated. Now let us approach the matter more closely by introducing another shorter division of Aristotle's treatise. First, it deals with the concept of the end. Secondly, with that pertains to the end, and near the close of the work the end itself is once again discussed, but more thoroughly many reasons are given why the end is dealt with before all else. First, because from its knowledge arises the substance of all things that are written later. Also because it is necessary that people have a goal set before them towards which they direct all their actions, like arrows at a target. We will see Aristotle bringing this argument not far below. Next, as you, you, you adds, to attain virtue is very hard work. Consequently, some reward for it should be proposed. Granted that we may reach the end at last, it is still appropriate, first of all, to know what this reward will be. Aristotle introduces many matters to be discussed concerning the end. First, whether it exists. Second, the form in which he decided to discuss it and the value in the current opinions concerning it. Third, what it is and what kinds of good it is contained. Fourth, the way to reach such an end. And last, what kind the end is. Cicero, Plato, Symposium, Eustratus of Nicaea, a Byzantine commentator on Ethica Nicomachea, 
and Vermigli's commentary on Book 1, Chapter 4, contains 46 references to his Anoratio in Principium Aristoteles Moralium and Nicomachium. The copies of uh, Eustratius in the Geneva Academy, which has acquired Vermigli's library, was probably his. See Donnelly, Calvinism, and Scholasticism. Is that another Donnelly reference? Something else that he did? Calvinism and Scholasticism? All right, so next is book one, Happiness. But I'm going to probably conclude this study session for now. I just... Last night I was having a few beers and I thought it would be cool to kind of look at this work. I hadn't even cracked it open for over a year. It was just wrapped in its plastic. So I thought, you know, why not? Why not just open her on up and take a look? And uh, I will look at some of Vermigli's other books, particularly his book on uh, the Eucharist. Uh, anyways, uh, my allergies are driving me crazy right now. So it's a good time to stop. And um, I'm happy to provide this content. Um, really, I'm going to be making a lot of videos probably like this. And from time to time, I'll put other things. I have um, some gaming books and stuff that I want to review as well that have to do with tabletop role playing. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. But um, right now, my philosophical and it's it's Southern Oregon. It's the West Coast um, uh, North America where we reside. And we're going to be heading into fall, autumn very quickly. And then it was going to get cold and dark early. Uh, just my favorite absolute time. Uh, maybe it's like Nordic blood or something. I don't know. But I love that time of year just to hold up and read. And going to get deeply entrenched into the books again um, would be my hope. I will make more videos. Um, I'm enjoying just being forced to read out loud. I'll probably be doing scriptural stuff. I'll probably be doing all kinds of philosophical, theological, religious, spiritual, possibly mythological, maybe get into some uh, psychiatry and mental health stuff as well. It's bound to be a smorgasbord of academic scholastic delight, I suppose. This is Justin William Savoy. Until next time, peace. God be with you.